All right, folks. Welcome. Uh, we have a great guest today, and today we're gonna be talking about content marketing. And for that, we have industry's leading voice on all things content, and that is Tamson Tamson Webster. Tamson, welcome. So Thank happy you. to be doing this. And, uh, I know we connected many many years back, and uh, we were planning to do something around content. Didn't pan out, but I'm so happy that this is happening right now, and you know we are able to get this going. So, um, Tamson, there is a lot of things going on around content. You know, we every day we hear, oh, create a lot more content, and then I think uh, both of us know how creating more content is not the answer. But I believe the answer is how to create the right strategic content and how to create that content which hits the right personas. And as the title of our conversation right now is how to create content that most likely your prospect say yes. Right, so welcome. I want I want to learn more about how to create that content uh, that people say yes to. So go for it. <laughs> well, I think as you say, we all know that we don't need to just create more content. We need content that creates more response in the directions that we're looking for. Um, and I mean that makes sense. We've got a lot. We've got a lot writing on it, and I think more often than not, we don't get those green lights, as I like to call them, that we're looking for. We get a lot of red lights instead. Um, and those red lights can take a lot of different forms. I, I I think they take kind of three primary forms. One is that we just don't get any attention. We create that content, and it's like it just goes out into the ether, and nobody responds to it, and we don't know why. Um, uh, the second thing is that we, we put it out there in the world and maybe even people will engage with it, but then they just kind of peter out, like they never do anything, they never kind of take the next step, or um, I'm not sure which is worse, that they do nothing or that they go with a competitor, but either way, they're not going with us, so that's not good. Um, and, then, and then one that I, I feel keenly, because I think it's probably one of the most painful for us as marketers, if, if you're in marketing uh, or sales, is that someone sees your stuff, they act on it, maybe they even buy from you, and then they regret the decision. And so that they, they, they just don't have any confidence with you. They suffer from buyer's remorse and they, they kind of nitpick and uh, just make your life a living hell in a lot of ways because they're just like, well, what about this? And can we do it this way? And why is it this way? And why is it this way? I think we've all experienced that. Um, and that's, that's a super frustrating place. So it's one of those things that I've really wanted to spend a lot of time in and figure out how is it we can increase the chances that people, you know, instead of getting those red lights or no lights, that they give us the green lights that we're looking for. Nice. Yeah, I mean, that is the whole purpose, right, of creating content. Uh, and I know you speak at so many conferences, you were keynoting at Digital Summit and things like that. So how do you go about creating that? You know, like I think everyone understands, yeah, I want to create the best content and a lot of content and the best content because we all want everything. So what is the process and how do you go about it? Well, I mean, I think before even getting the process, you, I mean, because the process doesn't really matter if you don't really understand why you're doing it. And so uh, the thing is that there's plenty of things that people do that actually get kind of temporary green lights that, that get people to go, well, sure. But then, again, if we're really looking for how do we get people to keep doing that, not regret the decision, not, you know, not go with somebody else, then we have to figure out some, you know, what does that look like? And so one of the things we have to understand, there's a real big difference in my mind between content that drives action, meaning yeah, they'll click or yeah, they'll have a meeting, whatever, and content that drives sustained action, which I'm going to refer to as change. Content that creates and, and marketing and messaging that creates an actual shift in thinking or behavior. Uh, and, and both are necessary. I mean, we need both, but I think that we've pretty much as, a, as an industry figured out how to drive action, but I don't think we're nearly as good about figuring out how to drive change. And what I've discovered is that the tools that we use to drive action are actually work fundamentally against driving change. Uh, and the primary tool that we use to drive action is pain. Mm. We, we kind of, you know, we're, over and over again, we're taught uh, that we should ex like, emphasize the gaps between what people have and what they want, that we should emphasize the gaps you know, between the status quo and what it could be. We should emphasize the peril that they may be in, the consequences of not acting. We're supposed to make the pain of status quo exceed the pain of change. And we do this over and over and over again. Uh, but the, the unfortunate thing is that it goes against a, a fundamental human need 
-hmm. And that fundamental human need is to be seen as smart, capable, and good. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, like, if you're showing people stuff that they don't want or kind of scolding them for not wanting your stuff already or you're trying to make people believe stuff that they don't believe or you're trying to, like, make them wrong for what they're doing so far, you're violating that fundamental human need. Hmm. And that pain, full stop, is the enemy of long-term change. And Because think about it. You're not going to continue to do something that hurts you. If you, if you, all of us learned at some point not to touch a hot stove, you didn't touch it by just like, well, let me make sure, let me make sure, let me make sure, like it, you will not continue to do something that's painful for you. And so this fundamentally is why people don't stick with something, whether it's a diet or whether it's your business, um, long term is because for some reason you've made doing that painful for them mentally. Hmm. So the process to kind of create content that makes people say yes uh, is really one that is designed to relieve pain, to relieve the pain of the decision, not introduce it. Um, mm-hmm. Or if you have introduced any amount of pain, to immediately assuage it and can give them the balm for it. Uh, you're right, and I think that is one. But there is also this fear tactic, right? So a lot of the content focuses on fear. Yeah, fear is and- another form of pain. So it's the same thing. It's you know, you're, The fear comes from activating this 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 belief that you may not have been as smart or as capable or as good as you thought you were and that's just another form of the pain so you're absolutely right bob like we we trade in fear and that fear creates pain and pain is the enemy of long-term change like it will it will 100 percent drive an action there's lots of data that supports that but we will not continue to do something that is painful for us to do right. we will not continue to act long term in that in the face so- so let's say I own a, you know, let's do the classic widget company, right? So let's say I own a widget company and, you know, my, my sales team need new leads um, because they've been saying that marketing doesn't co- provide us with good leads. Marketing is saying, like, you know what, let's do content marketing. Yeah. So, uh, so that means we need to hire someone to write our content. So how, what would you suggest to that content writer to create the type of content. Well, okay. and this goes back to my point. The problem can't be solved just by the content writer. It has to be solved by the strategy of the organization with how they're choosing to engage in the market. And the reason why I say that is because the content writer needs something to write about. And, and the thing is, in order to kind of relieve this pain of the decision, the way to think about it, Bob, is this, that a lot of times we think about how we're going to make our case for why they should do our thing. How can we make sure that we give them all the reasons and the benefits and you know, we create the differentiation about why we're better. We basically say, like, buy our stuff because what you're doing is wrong. You're, you know, your business is going to go to crap if you don't do it. And our stuff is better, you know. And so you're going to have to believe us, but just trust us and then buy. Like, that's how most of it, most of the time it works. Yeah. So that's building our case. But the thing that's least painful for someone is actually to build their case for your stuff which means don't give them all of your reasons. You need to give them their reasons. So one of the first things that this content writer would do is kind of go to the leadership of the organization and say, what question does our audience, our clients, our prospects have that they're actively looking for right now? Like think, what would they be searching for Google for that our product or our service is an answer to? That's where it has to start. Is not, you know, and it may be that they're trying to solve a problem, but we need to start with understanding where they are first and start with something that they want. And this is a great point because most of the times that we have seen is people are still on what they think is the problem, right? And the customer's problem, the way they define it, is so different. Very different. Yeah. And so one of the thing is to look at search intent that you just mentioned, Google. What yeah. are the ways can they find that? extract that kind of information? Well, I mean, the Google's great. It's you know, looking at how people land on your website in the first place. What's the language that they're using? Uh, talk to your front line, talk to your front line and prospect and customer facing folks. What are the questions? How do they, how do they frame it? I mean, we, again, it comes from 
it, unfortunately it comes from ourselves or the fact that we're saying, well, we have to differentiate, we have to set ourselves apart. But if all the language that you're using out there in the market is stuff that people don't understand because it's, it's like, well, it's your proprietary way to frame a problem. They're not looking for your proprietary way to frame a problem. They're trying to solve their problem. So your job, like the, the, the heart of building their case for your idea is to get them to move from answering their wrong question to answering your right question. So for instance, it can be, you know, if you think the right question should be, you know, um, uh, I don't know, what's a question that, that I, I, as a company that wants to sell to the widget makers would have, which is say, okay, well, how can we, uh, you need to make sure that you have, you know, a comprehensive you know, content marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, the widget company is saying, how can we sell more widgets? And what your job from a, from particularly from an early stage or awareness level content messaging standpoint should be was to get people from, you know, in the course of that content or repeated exposure to content to move from asking the question, how do we sell more widgets to saying, ah, in order to sell more widgets, I need a content marketing, comprehensive content marketing strategy. How do I build a content marketing strategy? Mm -hmm. See, you need to move them from their question to your question. And that's kind of one of the fundamental things. But you can't do that. You can't move them if you don't have good clarity about where they are right now. Right. So where you need to, that's you know, fundamentally where you need to start is what question are they asking right now. And then you, then you start to build, again, their case for their idea. Now, the next step is to say, well, they've been trying some approach um, to that so far. They've been, they've been doing something, you know, they've been, they've, you know, it's not that they're not trying to sell more widgets. They are. So we need to look at what have they been doing and what do they think the barriers are? Um, and if they think their barriers are time, money, or that just, you know, people don't know enough about us yet or whatever, um, you can look at it and say, okay, well, you're focused for good reason. You're focused on, you know, are you in all the right channels? Mm -hmm. And if, you know, the, the content marketing company is saying, yes, but it doesn't matter if you're on all the right channels, if the content that's in it isn't doing what it's supposed to, then you can start to say, okay, so for good reason, you were looking at all the channels, but there's another component to making sure that you get the awareness that you're looking for. And that is, is the content that's in those channels actually doing what you need it to? So you're finding this, what I call problem of perspective. You're, mm -hmm. you're doing that by finding what's right and what you think they're doing wrong. In other words, why would they be doing that? Like, why would they think that that's a problem? Uh -huh. Give them credit for that. And then you create a contrast with your approach to it as well. And how do you different? That's a great point. You know, like, you know, we, we create again, going back to step number one. But once you have found out, like, what is it? What's in it for them? I think most of the times as companies, we, f we f focus on the features uh, yeah. that we do and not on their needs. So then have you seen different type of content along the bio journey? Somebody's on the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, lower down the funnel. Again, um, how big of a difference have you seen? Well, I mean, it's, well, that's an important point, Bob, because you cannot use the same message to talk to people at three different points of the journey. Like they're asking different questions. And if you've done your job, you've actually moved them. So I like to mentally, I like to use this, this um, you know, mental analogy of, a, you know, of an American football field, right, where, you know, the, the end zone is like they are happy customers of you. Like, and, but, and you're the coach and your job is to move them down the field. A lot of times what we're doing is, that, you know, they're at the other end of the field. They're, you know, 99 yards away from where we want them to be. And we're essentially, we're essentially out there with Hail Mary messaging. We're basically saying, our stuff is awesome. Come on down. Right. And it may work occasionally, but just like a Hail Mary pass, like it's called a Hail Mary pass for a reason. Like All it right. doesn't happen that often. So we have to understand that, that that messaging needs to link up. There isn't just the messaging it's what's our early stage messaging what's our middle stage messaging what's our late stage messaging because just like football you're going to play a very very different game when someone is close to the end zone than when they're very far away and so you know it, 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 to me it's you know the, the format doesn't it it doesn't matter to me whether you know what format you use it's it's the heart of the message you know far away the heart of the message should be kind of like why have what you know? Why have you been struggling with answering this question for yourself in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, and again, that high stage messaging just might be like, "Hey, 
you may have been struggling with your awareness because you've been more focused on channels, again, for good reason, than you have on the content flowing through it. Um, so we need to make sure that you're, you know, kind of doing something that really looks at, you know, your content and its quality in a way that includes the channels but reflects them as well. And then once they're kind of at that point, they're like, okay, well, now that I need a kind of comprehensive strategy, like, what's the best way to build one of those strategies? Like, so that's their next question. And then you want to kind of get to a point where you're setting up the answer to that question in a way that goes, oh, so the best way to build a comprehensive content marketing strategy is to make sure that it is um, uh, uh, equally meets the needs of us and our audience. I don't know. I'm just saying that. Like, again, so then now they're there. Now their next question should be, well, how do I build a content marketing strategy that equally meets the needs of me and my audience? Uh -huh. And then eventually you're just moving them down the field until what you've built is a path to like all their answers to their own questions lead to you. That's, that's how you need to think about it. Now, yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, what we have also seen is different content resonates with different audience, you know, the titles and things like that. Have you seen any major differences into what type of content people were producing, say, five years back? You know, we used to do a lot of webinars, if you remember. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't, it's... Again, I, I I will fully admit that I have you know I, I designed the business that I have because I've never I've never loved chasing channels in the first place. I, it's always seemed to me that the channels are absolutely secondary to the the message and the content that's that's in them. Um, as far as formats, I mean, obviously the thing that's really taking off is is uh, audio and uh, and video still. Um, but I think the reason why people are struggling is uh, back to this reason that we're not actually looking at what is it that we're trying to do? We're telling, we're trying to tell our story in that content. We're not helping them build theirs. Mm -hmm. That's the fundamental difference. And that's the reason why I think people, no matter what format that they're talking about and no matter how those things change until you can figure out how to build their story for you, you're going to continue to struggle. Nice. Now, Tamsa, I know maybe, I don't know if you want to say, but any clients that or, or any companies that you've seen in your this thing who's doing this really well as an example? Um, I mean, it, I, I've got lots of examples of people that don't do it well. Um, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's hard to see it a lot of times out in the, uh, out in the world, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I, some of the work that, you know, a work, you know, client that I use a lot in my own stuff is a client called uh, Human Workplaces. They do a lot of work on, um, you know, engagement and culture training. Um, and so, you know, they have done this, I think, very important shift into helping people, into helping people understand how, kind of just asking how can we get more engaged employees uh -huh. um, is, needs, is actually a question that needs to be focused more on how do we make sure our employees feel engaged with our success and what they've been doing you know, out there I think is is very much in line with what I'm talking about um, but I'm not necessarily I'm not going to say you're going to go see like all their content everywhere right. it's like oh well absolutely that's yeah. that should be doing it but I, I think that's very helpful Nice. Uh, there's also a lot of talk about distribution because everyone is creating this content and then there is this whole part of distribution like you're creating this and how do you put it out there and you know how you attract more inbound folks, not just inbound but even from a sales point of view. What have you seen people not doing right when it comes to content distribution part of it? So, I, And that is not my area of expertise at all. It is okay. Because I mean, like I said, it's it's uh, there are people who talk about that really well. That is their area of expertise. Like where and where I'm focused is making sure that your ideas and your content are strong enough to build that distribution system on. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to see that there's you know oh if I look out there and see what the the mistake is, is that people are trying to distribute content that you know taken to its extreme is basically built on a tagline. I mean you you cannot build a whole content system or content marketing system or even a content distribution system on content that's basically one line deep. Like mm -hmm. it's your tagline. We mm -hmm. help people change lives. Right. And like you have to understand kind of what your full story is in order to be able to come up with that. And so that's why I just keep coming back to that. It's like, you know what? I, if you haven't solved this problem, then the distribution system is not your problem. Like, if you have solved this problem, then more power to you, and then then go figure it out. But if you kind of look at it and think that the distribution system is the problem, 
go back and make sure that your content is strong enough to be distributed first. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Now, have you seen like every like the the way people are building their content teams and organizations? Have you seen that going through a major change? Like you know, we had like these uh, chief content officers and things like that. And as it died down, where do you see that space in the market? I mean, I see what I see, and I you know, I I have just various peaks into the market, and particularly because I typically work with. Um, you know, a lot of uh, startups and founders, and then also with a lot of kind of challenger brands, particularly in commodity and market and manufacturing areas. Um, and what I've seen is a an appreciation for uh, the integration, not just of content, but of, of story and narrative. And so if you see any, you know, the, I say the kind of the new chief content officer or the folks that are chief storytelling officers mm -hmm. and that, that people who are and understanding, in my mind, this, this knowledge that it isn't so much about the deliverable of the content, and it's much more about how do we find the intersection between, you know, not just our marketing strategy, but our market strategy. What is our strategy and our understanding for how we, we will approach and interact with the market? And, and our content and our storytelling and our narrative building is a piece of that. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm seeing is a deeper appreciation. You know, I, see, I get clients, like even in the building and construction industry, that are saying, how can we add storytelling to our proposals? Like how, you know, in these like 300-page proposals, like how do we get that in there? How do we make sure that our story comes across? Uh -huh. um, and it seems like an impossible thing. How do we get our story across if we're trying to build the, the story they'll tell themselves? Mm -hmm. But that's where you have to kind of go back and say, well, you start with what they want, and then you have to find what's right and what, what they're doing wrong. You have to give them a problem they can solve. You have to give them right. the information that allows them to do that. And eventually, if you do that and you do it well, then they're going to come to your conclusion. And that really is that thinking. You know, it's obviously I'm doing, trying to do my part to get more people to understand that that's really where the long-term power is going to be in mm -hmm. content strategy. Um, but if I see a shift, it is a shift in, in, a, in understanding that exactly what I was talking about, that it's less about the format and much more about do we actually have something that's substantive and strong for mm -hmm. us to say. And that goes way beyond a brand positioning statement or something else. It's, it's right. fundamentally understanding, you know, do you understand the narrative of your business? Do you understand the story that you need your prospects and clients to finish? Do you understand the story they're telling themselves that you can help them finish? I just think we've taken a very one-sided view of that to date. Right. I start, right. I'm starting to see that shift. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we have we work with quite a few startups and mentor at 500 startups and other places. And one of the first things I see founders do is uh, create a uh, job rack uh, for a content writer. But on the other hand, I think outsourcing and getting a uh, consultant or an agency to do your content is much better. So when do you think, uh, where do you stand? On, on that like well again I don't think your content writer is going to do you any good if you don't know what the narrative is that you're building um, right. and I and since I've you know I've spent 20 years in branded message strategy I spent five you know 15 of that on client side and five of that in agencies and the thing that I've discovered over and over again is if you completely outsource your content and your narrative building it will never work for you long term mm -hmm. that's been my experience because it's way too easy for the client or the organization to to kind of anything that goes wrong with that message they're going to blame on the outside agency right. there's not enough ownership of it and that doesn't mean that you have to bring it completely in but what I've seen work re very very well when there is an organization that does want to work with an outside agency is that they should they should come to agreement together on what not the brand is or just the positioning state, but what the narrative is that they're trying to build what questions do they help people answer what problems of perspective that they don't know about do they help people solve what are the fundamental uh, assumptions and values that they share with their organ that their organization has that must be present in the company and the in the uh, prospects that they talk to, and there and what are the variations and approach that they represent in the marketplace? If you have those elements, then you and you've got agreement on those elements, then then an outside agency can then go and help you build on those elements. But then they're ones that because the organization recognized and helped build, they have much more ownership of. So you know my. You know, I, I don't, you know, I don't think you have to go outside. Um, I don't think, I think it's enormously helpful because I think a lot of times the expertise of the business should be focused on the business and not on the marketing piece of it. It's really hard for someone within an organization to stay up on 
all the changes in, in content distribution and formats and all of that. Um, but the owner of the narrative, uh, even if they get help of it, should always be the company itself. And right. if they've got that, then and, and they've got a belief that the agency that they're working with understands that, then they're going to be much more powerful. Um, and what I see particularly with founders is they hope that the copywriter will somehow be able to figure out what's magical about their business. And that's just not how copywriters are trained. Right. You need someone who understands strategy. You need someone who understands market strategy and the, the, the vagaries of content to be able to help you say, given what you're trying to happen and given the people that you're actually for, which is never everyone, by the way, we need a narrative. This is the narrative that, that actually unites those two things together. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to be done at the top levels of the business. It just does um, because it affects everything about the business. It affects what kinds of products you develop. It affects who you go after. It affects how your salespeople are going to approach the market. It affects, yes, it affects the content and the storytelling, but it's fundamentally a business strategy decision. Um, and because it doesn't, anything that you do in the marketplace is a product of that narrative. So if you don't actually surface it and actually talk about it, um, mm -hmm that it doesn't matter. You can't just like say, this is the brand that we wish we have and push down because this narrative, this thing I call the red thread is what's creating all of that in the first place. So that's what you have to identify. And then you're going to get way more out of your investment in some kind of outside, outside agency. Yeah. Because they can articulate your vision and you know why you are there in the first place. Yeah. And I think the articulation is what the agency or the writer can do. But Tam, is there any thing that I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? I know like I asked you a few things and, but is there anything you, I asked uh, that you want to get it off your chest? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think you've, you've obviously hit on a lot of my, my, my common rage points, which is just, you know, I think it's super, super important to make sure that you're, that you're strong, you know, that what you have is strong enough to build on. And, you know, what I see people do all the time, organizations, founders do all the time is that they zero in on, you know, a tagline or they think if we could just get our like three brand pillars, it'll be enough. But the problem is like when it comes out and you start to see that shift day to day, it's kind of like trying to blow up a low res image, right? If you've got a low res image, like if you blow it up, it looks like crap and it doesn't work because there's not enough data in it. And that's what I see happen all the time. Um, and so what I think, what, I, what works better, what I've just seen over and over again, and what I've seen with you know, organizations I've worked with and for, is that when you understand what the full story is, then, it, then you can shrink it down to that thumbnail. You can shrink it down to that one line, um, but you can't do it in reverse. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm so tired of looking at those brand pillars now. Everyone has some pillars, you know. But uh, how do, how do our audience reach you? Uh, sure. So uh, I the easiest way to find me is you know, all of my stuff is at TamsinWebster.com. Um, I'm I'm present on all the social networks. Uh, I am probably most active on uh, you know Twitter and Instagram uh, with a little bit of LinkedIn, but. Um, you can find me there. I'm Tamsin Webster on everything but Twitter. And on Twitter, I am Tamadir. Nice. So it's T-A-M, folks, S-E-N-W-E-B-S-T-E-R. Thank right. you so much for your time. This You're was welcome. Delightful. Sorry if I fired you up this morning. And oh, no. It's always it's good. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, when you live and you breathe and you're passionate about it, um, there's no way to hide it, right? That's, that's right. But thank you so much for doing it. And You're welcome, Yep, thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Sure.